So in three, two. Good evening. I now call to order the March 16th meeting of the Budget Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Slade if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Slade, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Mr. Kuhn. Here. Ms. Causey. Here. Ms. Hen. Here. Ms. Mack. Here. Mr. McMillian. Here. Thank you. Ms. Slade, please call the roll of staff members participating in today's meeting. Mr. Hartlove. Here. Mr. Tantliff. Here. Mr. Fannin. Here. Mr. Barra. Here. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tantliff, uh, could you please provide the committee um, with information regarding the report, the FY 2022 Q3 budget line transfers? Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, let me just share my screen. Um, hopefully the committee members are familiar with this report um, again, and you saw it just last month. And the reason we're showing it to you this month is uh, this is the quarterly budget line transfer report. Um, and again, this was uh, we developed with the budget committee to try to give you a feel as the year goes on for budget line transfers that crossed activities, which eventually uh, create the backbone for the budget appropriation transfer, which the full board will be reviewing at the first meeting in April. Uh, this uh, we reviewed Q1 and Q2 and we reviewed Q2 last month. We're reviewing Q3 this month because um, uh, the end of February is our is our cutoff for BLTs. So we're uh, going to do a essentially a short quarter because this should contain the final budget line transfers that go into the bat. Anything that comes in um, later this month, we'll only be able to do if they're very minor and can be worked within the confines of what we have. And the next uh, agenda item that we'll go through, I will uh, talk about the bat and the timing for that process. Um, board members have this report in board docs, so um, it's basically for information, but as usual, you can see offices right here, the magnet office put in a nine, almost a little over $9,000 BLT, for instance, to cover um, IB expenses for their projects. Uh, toners needed at the detention center, so they needed to move money. And again, um, these BLTs are normally within the same office or at least within the same chief, and they just are moving money between appropriations or activities. So um, you can see here, we've kind of written down the reasons for all of these different things, professional development for the VLP teachers, um, arts program at Carver, needs some special computer replacements, um, vacancies and grounds, they had to do a pretty large um, um, 
BLT to cover the increased contract for grounds maintenance. That's kind of been a recurring theme there. Um, it's also down here starting on line 28, contracted services for a number of different things in facilities due to um, the excessive vacancies we have. So we're basically moving money they have for the most part in salaries and moving them into contracts so they can pay all these bills. You can see it's re continuing. Um, right here, uh, print management services, we're just balancing the expenditures between activities. Um, this was pushing the um, extended year learning program dollars for the summer out to the site. So we held it centrally and now we're just pushing out the dollars as we get that direction. So these buckets up here are just where we had predicted the activities would be when the year began, but um, it doesn't work out exactly that way when CNI pushes these out. So it's uh, you know simply administrative. We're pushing these dollars out. There's a lot of schools, so there's a lot of lines. Um, uh, this move here was from within CNI. They were providing a dance floor at Dundalk. Um, this one was library CTE. Um, I don't you know we could go through as many as you like, but it's really to give you a feel for what goes into this stuff. And and really it's it's for the most part um, just bread and butter day to day expenses. They come out different than planned or in the count of in, in the case of vacancies, the year just um, isn't turning out as planned because of the excessive vacancies we have and we need to cover those contract costs um, as best we can within the budget line transfer process. Now what We'll talk about, I'll talk about that when we get to the BAT. So these are fairly minor. You'll also see um, you will also see, so here's music instruments. So just changing activity. Um, uh, this was uh, just a simple accounting transaction. Um, you know, to put the proper money into HR to fund the contract employees and to other um, org development programs. Um, here are some textbooks that are needed for year end that were self funding. What you'll see in the bat, if, if the superintendent um, and actually this um, Mr. Hart level need to approve them, but a number of the offices have requested additional bats as part of the year-end transfer, those will be fairly large. And so those are not in the BLT process yet because they have not been executed. But um, if approved by the superintendent, because we uh, will have room in the budget this year, the board will um, see and hopefully approve those types of transactions. Uh, display panels that the board approved. This is just putting the money in the right activity. And then some fairly small ones for psych services. So, you know, it's similar in flavor to the other reports you've seen, and hopefully it's starting to give you at least some comfort um, on, on how this process works. Be glad to take any questions on the report. Okay, board members, um, I see Lisa Mack has a question. Ms. Mack, please go ahead. Um, Mr. Tantler, thank you for this. And I have a couple of questions. There were quite a few lines, um, and I have this up on my home computer, so give me one minute, that talk sure. about student incentives. And that is on page two, it's most of the page. Um, associated with extended year learning. Can you tell me what that is? Um, hold on. The object name is student incentives. Okay. Mm. 
Okay. Right. Yes, that's that's what I'm looking at. Um, I will have to get you information on literally uh, what they're spending that money on, but it's basically part of the summer school program. Um, I I I don't honestly know what types of things they're buying uh, right there with that line item, but we can find out. So my question about that is similar to my other questions. Um, I'm, I am the chair of cur curriculum and we have talked about the extended year programs and the various things that go into them. We have also talked about in curriculum the display panels and we've talked about the many contracts for textbooks. I, I guess I'm just a little unclear on the process since we approved contracts for each of these things, or at least for the two things, and then talked about the end of year or, or extended year learning. Where is the money sitting that we have to transfer it? Um, let's see. So um, to, to unpack that, uh, let me just restate your question and make sure I have it. Your question is really, we approved the contract already, so why is it showing up here in the budget line transfer? Yes, process? that's exact, that, yeah. exactly, because I'm very um, familiar with all three of these things. Sure, so um, when it comes to the board uh, to get the contract approved, the portion that's in the current year, because as you know, of course, many contracts cover multiple years of expenditures. Right. But um, whoever the owner of the contract is will have, you know, and it gets, of course, confirmed that the proper account strings there and the money and all that. They may have the, the correct amount of money to pay for it, but maybe the contract in its final form ends up being a little different than where they planned it going into the year. So the contract might have been $2 million dollars but the account string it's needed on maybe only has a million of that. Um, and where they thought they might um, it be where they budgeted the rest of it, or it could just be funded through some other underspend um, that wasn't planned in the beginning of the year, but they have a million dollars somewhere else in a different activity. They need to move the money to the correct place. Or maybe it's something in CNI um, that is a priority and uh, Dr. Boswell McComas needs to pull money from a few different places put to put them uh, exactly where the contract is gonna be charged to. So it's really just from an accounting standpoint, if you wanna think about that, putting the money on the correct account string, because when you get the contract, it indicates the correct account string, but to um, provide the funding needed for this year, some money may need to be moved around. It's available um, for the portion for this year, but it just might be sitting somewhere else. So I just have one more follow up question to that. So if the board would not approve one of these contracts. Then. The like you said, half the money could be sitting there and then half could just be moved to cover the contract. Do we then do something else with the half that we had? Um, so your question is, so the same two million in question. Uh, the, but the, the contract doesn't get approved. Yeah, con so then uh, there's two million dollars that was going to be spent on that item that now either won't be spent, so it'll be part of our underspending at year end that would go into fund balance, or the office may propose a different way to spend that money or maybe put a different type of contract in front of the board that may be acceptable. OK, thank you. And Mr. Tantle, if you'll follow up with us on the student incentives. Sure, I'll find out some examples of what uh, can be purchased with that object. Okay. I, I just you. haven't been asked the question before. Sorry. OK, thank you very much. And yeah, Mr. McMillian, please go ahead with your question. Thank you. Mr. Tantliff, I'm not a, a numbers guy and I'm trying to do the best I can to understand all this stuff. Uh, as you were going through there, you I saw something that said Jim Mats and it was being paid by the science department and you you were going through real quick. 
With, and I'm just trying to understand that. So that I'm thinking that was a particular school and they had a need for gym mats and the science department had extra money. So the science department agreed along with the leadership that that money from science would go over and pay for those mats. Is that does that sound it, probably right? Um, yes, it certainly could be. Um, I don't, it's uh, I couldn't tell you where it was. It, you, no, that's OK. I, I mean, I was purposefully going through just to get oh, here. It is. Um, OK. So this. So, yeah, so academics uh, somewhere within Dr. McComas's uh, department. She needed to supply gym mats for phys ed. Um, you know, 41,000. There's a lot of gym mats that were needed. Bus trips for field trips are being significantly underspent this year uh, just because we're really just able to travel for the first time now. And, and actually, I'm, I'm speaking out of terms. I don't know the policy, but certainly up until this point, when we went when we became unmasked, there was very there were very few field trips being taken. So she probably had money available there and there was a need to buy gym mats. And so Within C and I, they move money around from where they were underspent to where the need was. Okay, would you mind moving that that chart over to to the left so I can see where that? Yeah, where to go? Yeah, so it was science field trips. So it was okay. in the science office. You're exactly correct. They didn't spend money on field trips that they budgeted. So you know they're looking at the global C and I when and what needs to be funded and moving money around as needed. Right. And that wouldn't be at one school, most likely. That's probably a number of different schools. Yeah, that would have been a central office account. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Causey, you have a question. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Uh, yes, and I asked this question at the uh, last month's meeting, which is Public Works recommendation specifically uh, states that the budget allocation transfers should come to the board three times a year and um, they should come before the money is spent. Um, and because that uh, <clears throat> has to do with the lack of accountability and transparency and um, they're quoted, it undermines the authority of the board in approving the budget and allocating resources to programs. So given the information that you've provided, uh, at what times of the year would it be um, best to provide the two additional bats before the expenditures are already reallocated and spent? Ms. Causey, could I ask you a quick question um, before we have Mr. Tantliff uh, address yours? Um, was there a dollar amount um, that that was in that report that they suggested that we focus on, you know, items above 250,000 or a million or what have you, or is it, I mean, we have some very small numbers here. I mean, these are specific lines moving within the same area, right? So for instance, the CNI stuff is saying, staying within CNI uh, from what I can tell. So my, can, my question is, was there clarity and as to the depth that they they expect the board to get engaged, I, I don't have an issue with it. I'm just curious as so if there was not, any more guidance. Well, thank you for that question, because I think that is an important question. It does have to do with materiality as well. Um, and there is not a dollar figure that I recall, but hopefully fiscal services staff has been reviewing public works recommendations and maybe they have clarification. But I did uh, just earlier in this meeting hear staff say that there are some fairly large uh, budget allocation transfers that will be coming but are not coming yet. And so those fairly large ones, the specific statement by Public Works is the board should see them before all of the money is spent. So that as Mr. Pantliff said, if the board uh, did not approve a certain com contract, uh, the underspend could go to the fund balance, which has been an issue of concern from the county government over previous years, previous years, um, or staff could bring a different contract. So there would be time uh, 
to make additional decisions. Okay, just so I'm clear, Mr. Tantliff, and, and you can address uh, Mrs. Causey's question here, but no money is spent on contracts that we have not already approved, correct? And, no, uh, that's it just a, requires, an the company rule. requires right. a new con. This is completely in. I mean, it's tied to contracts in that you might have to move money to support the contract, but the process for the board um, going through buildings and contracts and the full board uh, voting on a contract is a completely independent activity from this. And, you know, I'll, I'll say again, many contracts span over multiple years, so the money wouldn't even be appropriated yet until those future years occurred. Mr. Kuhn. I'm sorry, did did Ms. Causey, was your oh. was there more was there something else you wanted uh, from Mr. Tantliff before I move on to Ms. Hen? I well, had so, a, yeah, so the question is not answered. The, the question is not answered. Okay. The question is what would the timing be to uh, provide two additional budget allocation transfers to the board? before all of the expenditures have already been spent. Um, so my, uh, uh, I, I believe my answer last month will be the same answer I give now in that um, there's a couple of different things. In requesting a budget appropriation transfer occur three times during the year doesn't make sense from a technical standpoint because it's so early in the year, we don't know if we're gonna to need to do a budget appropriation transfer. So in other words, we don't know what our vacancy rates will be. We don't know a contract might not be approved by the board. So if we had to early in the year predict what budget appropriation transfers are done, we might very well ask you to move money from point A to B, and then the next quarter ask you to move it from back from point B to point A. We asked for the budget appropriation transfer once we have a firm idea of what spending will be for the year. I'll also mention that the county government only entertains budget appropriation transfers at year end. So if the board uh, did approve them, we would have nowhere to go with that because a, a bat is only final once the county council approves it and their process only allows that to happen at the end of the year. Well, perhaps they're not aware that the spending actually gets done earlier in the year before the board approves it and before they get a chance to approve it. But my understanding has been clarified by the Public Works recommendations. So I guess a larger question is, is fiscal services evaluating Public Works recommendations related to the current practices? And what is the uh, process for implementation or telling the board that these specific ones are uh, you've chosen to not implement. Um, and again, my question was about the timing. When would the timing be appropriate? I didn't ask you to do it early in the year. So, well, after I quarter mean, one, we know how much vacancies we know after quarter one. But we don't know how many are going to be filled the rest of the year. But to answer your question, Dr. Williams. Um, you know, the report out on the status of all the recommendations in the efficiency report um, go through Dr. Williams. I believe he has another report out coming very soon. And uh, the status of everything within the report, you know, I think is funneling uh, through him. But um, to address the board's concerns, We've developed this report, which literally shows you every single line item, every transfer that occurred. And Mr. Kuhn mentioned it, most of these, almost all are within the same office. So they might've just planned in one activity and they have to move money to a different activity. It's something that if it was in the original budget um, that the board approved, it, it, it's nothing you would take notice of. They just it's because the total dollars aren't changing. They're just moving it technically from one activity to another. So where the final spending takes place is in the correct MSD category. We're showing you this report every quarter. Um, and hopefully, as I said, that this is what we came up with last year to address this very issue, that the board was not being informed 
of what goes in to the bat at year end. And uh, the items I mentioned that could go forward that are large, the board would have to approve them before that money is spent. So for instance, we, we may um, put forward a proposal oh, within the Mr. bat to Mr. spend Tantler. more textbooks. Yes. Uh, I, I don't I don't want to cut you off prematurely, um, but I think you've addressed the question and um, I'd like um, uh, Miss Hen to ask her question at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. I had a related question, which I'll ask first and then I had a, um, another question. Um, my first question is um, and good afternoon, Mr. Tantliff. Hi. Um, hi. You had mentioned that there were several larger items that are not included in the BLT report that will be coming to us in the bat. Is did I understand you correctly? No, I said some offices have proposed um, significant year end bat items that will need to get approved first by Mr. Hartlove, then it'll go to superintendent and uh, the cabinet if they'd like to bring that forward in the bat. I I'm just making the point because it happens at most. Um, at year end, when we have more money available and there's critical needs, um, the chiefs via their staffs will put in requests for the superintendent to approve for inclusion in the bat. So you'll see those items and would be able to approve those items before they're spent. Okay, so that, that will take place before they are spent. Will the board approve those the bat before they are spent as well? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It will, if the superintendent says in the end, I mean, you know, Mr. Hartlove will see it, a number of people see it, but in the end, if the superintendent says, yes, let's please bring this forward, we will include it in the bat that you see, the board will discuss it, and if there's, uh, you know, something that the board doesn't like, hopefully there will be nothing in that situation, hopefully everything will be, make sense and be logical to you, but uh, if you didn't approve the bat, um, then then there wouldn't be money to buy that item. Okay, so that addresses um, Mrs. Causey's concern, which is mine as well, in that any large items, and again, Public Works didn't make any um, specific amounts in their recommendation that the board approve any variances to the budget prior to the expenditures being incurred. Um, but it does address um, significant, uh, those of materiality, I should say, in that those would be brought to us in the bat before um, the expenditures are incurred, it sounds like. Well, I, 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 I don't want to uh, beat it to death, but I'll just say, again, there were a couple of large ones in here where facilities had to move money around to make sure they had money to pay the contracts because they have so many vacancies, for instance. So within their total budget, they moved money around because it was, from an accounting standpoint, it was in an incorrect activity. So the things I'm talking about year end would be new things that need to be funded with the BAT, but there could be large things that are within the BAT that you're seeing on the quarterly basis. So with those new things then, and I'm trying to, that, that brings me to my second question is what, would constitute something that would not appear on the BLT then? Something new that was not accounted for in the budget originally that the board did not approve? Um, you mean what What would I have not Long shown you so far in the report? What would not show up on this report of BLTs that would come to us in the BAT? Okay, so the only thing that would be consisting of the BAT are a couple of things. It's A, um, if there is a large, initiative. So um, CNI wants to buy $5 million of textbooks. They don't have, they'll, they'll expend whatever they can, but they still need 5 million more. It needs to come from uh, probably from other offices that are underspending. That would be captured at the year end bat. And we don't really try to do it earlier normally because we don't know what our position is no. going to be until we get towards the end of the year. The only other thing in the bat is we'll move more money than is needed because we have to have a cushion as we come into year end. So if we think, you know, one activity is going to be a million dollars over, we'll move more than a million because we'll want to make sure that 
uh, anything unanticipated, just through normal um, spending uh, doesn't cause us to go over in that activity. So we might move 1.6 million into that activity from someplace where we have a significant underspend. So that'll apply to the board office budget then too for legal services. Sure. Yes. Awesome. And then my my final, sorry, 2A of that or 2B. Oh, well, um, let me just say, I'm sorry, Ms. Hunt. It, it might not because if activity one overall in the system has plenty of cushion, we wouldn't need to identify anything in the bat to cover that because there's enough, because again, it's only when we don't have enough money in the activity that we need to put it in the bat. So if the overall board office budget then is is covered, then we wouldn't need to put it in the bat. Well, the bat itself, activity one is many millions of dollars. It's a lot of IT expenses. It's everything under Mr. Hartlove. It's everything under HR. You know, it's a big activity. The board is a very small piece of that. So even if the board is over budget by a, a modest amount, it won't necessarily cause the total system activity to go over budget. So that padding then is only done at the activity level? Yeah, so again, if, if in, oh, it could be through five offices, um, you know, activity two and the principals, we think we're gonna be a million over. We'll need to find, you know, say 2 million from other areas and move it over to cover the million plus put a cushion in there. Okay, and, and lastly, and I think this will be the easiest question. Did I understand you correctly to say that the BLTs, there's a cutoff for those at in February, the end of February, and that you asked for all of those to be? Yes, it was, that. yes, it was last Friday, and you know, we'll take some stragglers if it's an absolute emergency. And once, once the back gets approved, we can only uh, approve something if it's within the confines of what the board already approved. So we really push all the offices to get everything in we get together we look at the projections we look where we're going to stand um, and you know we use that as the basis um, for the bat we're scheduled to meet with mr hartlove on friday and give him a first look at what we think might need to be proposed so as of that point then do we operate under the assumption that any vacancies as a fourth quarter will remain vacant and that our department heads no using no. those or are they saying okay we don't know what what's going to happen with those vacancies we're going to con continue to try to fill them through fourth quarter so they are not accessing those funds no we will absolutely try to fill every vacancy unless there's uh some one-off that the superintendent has a question about but certainly every school-based position everything in facilities everything in special ed those positions are all getting filled most of the central office positions as they become vacant there's a process where uh, mr hartlove presents them to the superintendent and uh, fiscal issues and gets approval to fill that job we're remember we're using big numbers so we're looking at the aggregate of all our positions we think this activity is going to be two million under budget based on the run rate we have but that run rate means a, a job gets filled, a job comes open, a job gets filled. A jo you know, so we take a conservative approach. We look where we really think we're going to be short on funds, and that's where we we'll move money into. This has absolutely no impact on how any individual will spend their money. Uh, it will be according to how they plan. But for the offices, we try to get from them exactly what they plan to spend. And so we can capture if they're going to be underspent. But for the positions, it's just the normal in and out makes up the projection for the year. Right. And and if we say if roughly 80% of our overall appropriation is salaries, and mm -hmm. if that, uh, again, roughly translates into 80% of our <laughs> um, variance or available um, funds for transfer, then, yeah. we, then we would expect the largest portion of the bat or the largest portion of transfers to be coming to us in the bat, not to be reflected in the budget line transfers. Is that an accurate assumption? Because the department heads can't spend their um, available salaries because those vacancies could be filled as late as the fourth quarter. That's where the money's coming from. 
but what I'm showing you is where the money has to go to. So, so the concern is where are we short at the end of the year? That's so we're short a million. We need to look where we've underspent year to date, and that's where we're going to move the money from. So that's part of what you see in the batch. But it's right. also these movements, some of these movements that, you know, you see here are making up the balance where we're sitting at year end that we have to put it back into balance. Right. But that's why the back could be much larger. Ye I, I think so. So, okay. so let me let me thank you, Ms. Hen. Um, I have a few questions and I'm, I, I think what uh, Ms. Hen was really getting to, and I think you can answer this really easily, um, Mr. Tantliff, is, you know, the budget's dynamic and you're supposed to burn money evenly across the entire year. If you haven't filled a position for quarter one, you now have one quarter of that salary sitting there. And when you're talking about being 200 plus people low, that adds up. And if you keep going through, you know, yeah, I know you, you hire people, but still now you have one quarter sitting there of the salary of X number of people. That is not reflected anywhere here. But, but I, I don't need to move money. To no, no, I know that. you don't need to. Yeah. My, my yes, point is correct. that's what the bat is going to have in it, right? It's going to have this big... We'll you know, grab the money from there to cover money. other shortfalls. Right, that hasn't been, that hasn't needed to move within yes. wherever the HR departments are and, and move around that way because, I mean, that's probably where the significant amount of, of Yes, of most of our, most of our underspend is coming on the salary lines. That's where okay. we would pull money to cover other expenditures. But that has no impact on hiring. Yeah, no, I'm not saying it does. Yeah. I'm, I'm just illustrating that if the person's not hired day one, he's not getting paid until he's hired on yeah. day 100 or whatever. And yes. all of that money is not, you know, it's obligated but not spent. And that's what you are transferring at some point in time. Only if, if we need to. Only if we need to. Well, I, I would I argue you would never need to. You would always need to because you're not going to overpay that person three quarters of the year to, to make up for that amount. But I don't I don't worry about the bad if I'm underspent. But that's the money you have left over. It's money that's left over, but I only, I don't need to request a bat for that. I only need to ask permission where I need extra money in the category. That'll reduce the money I'm spending in the category. So copacetic, everything's good. I think it represents an up, you know, it's it's some do, there are some dollars that are savings that we didn't we couldn't necessarily predict. Those dollars can be used at year end as if, if there was something we couldn't uh, uh, step, uh, that ended up being more expensive than we thought, or these year end opportunities that Witt was talking about, Mr. Cantliff was talking about, like if we decided we needed to buy some additional textbooks. It, it represents an opportunity that we don't know that we're going to necessarily have at the beginning of the year. That tends to be why it ends up happening at the end of the year is because, you know, we don't really have a good grasp on that early on, but later on we start to find out. Like we, we put our budget together. It's a plan. We do it way in advance of the actual year. We look at next year. We're, I think we all sit here today hopeful that it'll be a very normal year. And we may not have anywhere near the number of vacancies next year that we have this year. That's our hope. Um, and you know, we really, you know, if, you know, if I had a crystal ball, I wish you know I, that would be what we would see. Um, but who knows? Maybe there'll be some kind of a spike, and we'll have more vacancies again. And so we can't do it until we know for sure. Sure. Fair enough. I have. Um, I need to move on. I do have two points that I'd like to to make and ask very quickly. On page five of this budget line transfer, I am seeing um, um, uh, the mathematics pre-K-12 to mathematics instructional contract employee, a $250,000 transfer. And it's like two thirds of the way down. Um, I'm sorry, on that page. I know I have it in Excel here. Uh, this okay. guy. Yeah, right. So, so my question about that is, um, 
I understand it's going to fund a contract employee. It's for this fiscal year, correct? That was actually going from a contract employee to textbooks. Oh, so the plus here. So I see the I, I'm so I see the. Am I reading this thing wrong? Because no, that's it, a positive it, number and I see a bunch of negatives and I just assume the negatives were where the money was coming from and the positives yeah. are where the money was going. Um, you see a BLT yeah. amount. Yeah, if it's positive, money's going there, right? Uh, yes. So money is going to a contract employee from wherever. And in, in, in this this area, right? Um, it it looks like it might be for some professional development. I think they did a whole group at once. So um, yeah, con you know, contract employee is kind of all, all sorts of stipends for PD and that sort of thing. So it looks like uh, that's where these dollars are going. Okay, uh, my, my, my question about this, um, and, and hopefully that is what it's for, because I just wanted to make sure that we weren't paying someone $250,000 no. from March until the end of June. Or if we were, does it, is it a contract that spreads out over time outside of FY22? So that was my question question there. And then the next, the only other thing I, I need to point out is if you continue to go down in the note to the right uh, about technology support services, you had mentioned. Mr. Kuhn, I'm sorry, if you just look yeah. here, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. This kind of explain here, it's the AVID professional learning, um, 400 teachers attending AVID professional learning. So you're paying them the stipends to do that. That's kind of what that's covering. Is that what everything in this lot? Yeah, this? this that's this is all one transaction. So, okay, so we've taken a million dollars out of out of textbook spending to to send people to training. I'm just if it is accurate, that's all I'm asking for. Oh uh, well, no, it's it, it's coming out of all these negatives here. Okay, because I see 1.1 million, and I thought that was for it says new curriculum textbooks, and I'm like, okay, great, they're buying new books. I always talk about that in meetings, so good. Um, yeah, now it looks like this part of it might be the textbook person. Yes, that's yeah. what yeah. I figured out so far. Sorry so my, my only other question on here is we're talking about $2.64 million transferred. And the reason why I'm asking, because it's talking about panels, right? And we're yeah. about to enter and, and lease a bunch of panels, but this says we're gonna take that money and we're gonna purchase. We're going to start by purchasing panels and then we're going to lease going forward. I just under I that's just a question as to what's actually happening. If you look at the note, it's a big, big fat note there. Yes, right there. <clears throat> um to purchase display panels. Yeah. And then it's going to say they're going to be purchased. Beyond that, they will be leased. So yeah, I think it's just confusing. Yeah, sorry, say it again. It's just confusing. We're buying panels and we're leasing panels. Like I thought we we're trying to do it all. Well, I think um, because that money was available, so they could just get a big chunk of them out of the way, and then it's planned as a lease uh, in the out years. Okay. I when we're mixing purchasing and leasing, I just want to understand the dynamic because I know that we did, we purchased a bunch of Chromebooks with a bunch of CARES money uh -huh. and then we're leasing and we're leasing, right? So um, you know, then we have different equipment and inventory in the system and we have to manage it because if we own it, we're not handing it back. Sure. Right. Wait, could that could that be uh, instead of purchase? Could it be procure? Yeah, because maybe we just use the word purchase, but we really meant we're procuring them, and the way we're purchase the way we're procuring them is we're leasing them. You know, because I get I get the confusion. We're purchasing or we're leasing. I know we kind of we use that procure purchase yeah. interchangeably. See, it is because see, it was planned on the lease line. 
and it's in the purchase and it's in supply so it's being purchased so it's being bought out right okay all right we need to move on okay. um, thank you for <laughs> entertaining all of our questions uh i know you have two other items in this agenda um uh, if the budget appropriate the, the timeline i think you've kind of spoken to it do you want to just highlight the highlights yeah i'll do it in 10 seconds <laughs> Go ahead, please. Let me find it. Hold on, I don't. Um, it's an attachment and. Um, yeah, I know. Add it. It's one one page. Um. And, Sorry, give me 10 seconds. Let me just reopen it. Sorry, it's it's going to take 10 seconds here. OK. <clears throat> OK, here it comes. OK. <clears throat> but because the bat is coming up <clears throat> as in, in conjunction with the BLT, um, this was just going to review the process. We don't really need to talk about it, and we have essentially talked on it. The budget consists of 13 appropriations by activities, and the bat is moving dollars to where they're needed. Um, schools and office request amendments to their budget, as you know, based on close monitoring expenditures. Um, we always show an overall surplus unless something catastrophic happened, but there's always going to be some shortfalls in some activities and surpluses in others, and the bat evens those things out. The board and the county council approve them, and, and as you know, you receive updates throughout the year, every quarter, through the BLT report that we developed. And the timeline is the year begins. Um, you get the first two quarterly reports, February 18th that we um, indicated was the deadline to submit uh, BLTs, though there are some stragglers that came in after that deadline until so we capture them because the process for the BAT hasn't closed down. Um, we just did the BLT with you. The BAT will be at the board in uh, April 5th. And early June, it'll go to the council. That's it in a nutshell. Okay, we're moving on. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Tantliff, um, can you and Mr. Ara please uh, provide us a report on the Every Student Succeeds Act? Absolutely. Um, Greg, you want to share your screen? Uh, let me introduce uh, Mr. Barra. He works for Pat Fannin, the controller. Uh, he's a supervisor in the accounting office, and he is on point to put the uh, ESSA report together and does a fabulous job with it. Turn it over to you, Greg. Thank you. Good evening. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen and bring up some of the reports. Yeah, your overview and then the report, I think. Mm -hmm. OK. All right. Hopefully you can see what I have. Yes. Yeah, all of this yes. is in board docs. So, yeah. Right. So, I uh, just want to start off by uh, pointing out. So, ESSA reporting is done under the, um, done under MSDE's uh, reporting standards here. Um, so, this is a reporting manual that MSDE has uh, issued. Um, it existed previous to November 21, um, not in such a nice format, but it existed. So they did come out obviously in November and formalize the report a little nicer. And here's such said manual. So um, I went ahead and um, pulled together some key points uh, from the manual. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to just run through them quickly and um, kind of give you an overview of the, the ESSA reporting and, and kind of what it takes and, and what goes into the reporting. 
can you sure. i'm sorry uh, um would it be possible to actually pull up the report and then speak to what's actually in it i mean i understand i don't under, you know and you could talk about the process as you were re re looking at the the report it's i think it's only five pages if i understand like the yes it is five pages sure we, we could do whatever you'd like i just was gonna go through that but um we could go right to the report and i appreciate it i'm sorry we've eaten up so much time no, no worries. The first item uh this was supposed to be the bulk of the discussion um uh and and we appreciate your time so sure thing okay so um so this is uh, in all uh clearly stated this is the worksheet that is prepared using the manual um and this is provided to msde again um is due to them on december 20th um every year assumably going forward um so we provide this they uh, they go through a process of reviewing it uh providing some um comments if you will and then we go through the process of correcting the report to ensure that they're in agreement with what we have so um hey greg high level why don't you just describe the what is included in the report because some some panel mem members may not be familiar with it oh, oh okay like uh, the deliverable what's the report's purpose okay so well the deliverable is really just um this report here uh, this is really what is provided to MSDE um, at the end of the day, if you want to say it like that. Um, so this is really the report itself. This is what I believe um, MSD post on their website, uh, you know, related to this. So um, this is the actual, actual report itself. But I mean, just just describe what's in the report like what why was this report created just sure. so they're, they're grounded in what you're talking about so they know what information is contained gotcha okay so the, the obviously the overall concept was to really provide to get to a dollar amount of how much um money is spent per student at at each school um so that was really the gist of the whole you know report and why we have the report um MSD came out obviously with all the, the methodology to come to a conclusion uh, for the report. So, um, and that allows everyone to have a consistent basis amongst the, the school systems methodology wise. So, um, I'm not sure where we wanna go. I'm happy to go through the report and kind of walk through some of the key areas or, or take questions, what have you. But um, this is a template that provided by MSD um and that we i whomever you want to say is responsible for populating the template and then using the manual in conjunction with this we go through the steps that msd is outlined in order to come to a conclusion so the report is made up of you know multiple tabs in here or not the report but the worksheet is made up of multiple tabs we have an expenditure um i'm sorry we have an expenditure uh tab here of i'm having a little trouble moving where can i go um i'm sorry i have a <laughs> i'm not sure what's what's gotten me jammed up here but so why don't we do this i might have scroll lock on yeah why, why don't we go to the actual report that has been provided to the committee right it's the yes. five page one and okay so um i see that there's a number of highlighted cells here can you describe why they're highlighted i know they're all pretty high <laughs> but yeah uh, it's that way for a purpose well let's start there so the, the the fact of the matter is when i the highlight is done by myself um and it was really only highlighted to send it over to when it goes to the superintendent they have the ability to add comments if they so choose. Um, so I went through the, the, if you wanted the exercise of highlighting some of the higher ones. And I believe the way I did this, this is going back a few years, but uh, the way I did this was I essentially came up with an average of all the costs and then figured out who which ones were over the average 
and so on and so forth. So there were a few that or you know, a few um, that are highlighted that are greater than the average. Um, so, so that's the reason for the highlights. All right, thank you. Now, this this combines federal, state, and local funding for the school system, and then it's all broken down by school, by by student that's enrolled in that school. Correct? Yes. Okay. Now, there is significant variation, right, from school to school. Um, and one of the things that, that we talked at the last committee meeting, we had uh, the Title I folks come in and explain to us how decisioning is made on which schools that they select. So can you tell us what we should expect to see? Because I, I could guess, but I would like you to tell us, you know, as I'm looking at this and um, I see, you know, some, some higher spending there, does it, does it jump out in the federal column? Um, and and I could I could easily highlight it and tell there like where how can I or can I not tell here how can I find the Title One schools here uh, the Title One schools you would have a Title One enrollment so you would see column I, there's no column numbers but it says Title One it's called Title One so you get a Title One enrollment so that would kind of be the uh, indicator okay At, and. Uh, and those guys, those those schools generally are going to have very high federal buckets too, because of that. Right, and then the the Title One enrollment does not always match the overall enrollment, correct? Um, <clears throat> yes, that's correct. You you will have some instances where, um, you know, it's a Title One school, so you would have full enrollment would be Title One. Um, you may have some, it, again, a few years back, this is 2020's report, a few years back, you had targeted assistance. So it wasn't always 100% um, Title I, but I do believe in fiscal year 21, um, there's no targeted assistance. We've gone to full, you're either Title I or not. And this is 20. We're looking yes. at 2020 data, so that's not accurate on this on, on this report. I'm sorry. So that wouldn't be reflected on this report. We would still have. In, yeah, I'm sorry. In this report, you will have some schools that are still targeted assistance, correct? OK. And um, when would we expect the 21 report to be available? I believe it's already been submitted. Yes, it's been submitted. I, I obviously I can't provide a date. I can tell you that, for example, the fiscal year 21 that we do have here, uh, you'll see that it was reviewed and approved on uh, April 26, 2021. So um, I'd like to I'd like to believe that it's on its way to being finalized at some point within the next month. Okay. So I, I'm I'm going to lead you through some of these 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 columns so that we understand what's happening here. Sure. When so we have. I believe what's called special ed, and then we have EL. Is that? Are, are we looking at the this report? Yeah, yeah. I'm going across. I'm trying to like break it down because my understanding is, as I look at this, right? Mm -hmm. If there are people categorized in these categories, then the funding would be increased per that number of students for that school. Is that accurate? I mean, again, this this is just reflecting what has happened, not not additional fundings in the future or anything like that. So, but to answer your question, if you're looking across this, the, fir the first column you have there with numbers is the enrollment. That's obviously student enrollment. Your staff is your staff at the schools. Um, your square footage is your square footage per this from, you know, for each school or center building, what have you. Uh, Special ed is the next column, so that would be all your special education enrollment. EL is English English language. That would be um, all students enrolled in, in English language. Um, Title I is Title I. Um, CTE is another um, bucket, if you will, for criteria for um, allocations at some point so so those are all the pieces that you see there and the related um 
either enrollments, square footage, staffing numbers that go right. Up. So just just I'm going to ask this question and then I'm going to start letting other um, okay. members ask <laughs> questions. But each one of those columns that have an enrollment number, there are dollars tied to those columns, correct? So for instance, if there is a special ed student, there is special ed funding that is going to follow that student and be allocated into that school. Is that is that accurate? I, I don't know if that's accurate. That's not that's not really what this report in my mind is is doing. So um, you know, th those numbers of what whatever column you want to choose, right? That those are used for an allocation method, right? So at some point what are so, you allocating? Okay, so back to the No, but you're allocating funds, correct? Um, you know what you that's that's what what's going on here is this is an this is an, a report to to show what we've actually spent per per student right what the what the enrollments are there for is to show what drives expended expenditures not how dollars were out is this is not like okay here's how much we're going to give a school this is um looking at what schools have spent and certain certain expenses that we have central maybe um, get allocated to schools based on various like special ed enrollment for instance so so you, all we're doing here is showing how all the dollars that baltimore county public schools spent allocating those out uh, based upon the enrollment it's not so it's not like a funding and here's what you get go spend the money this is after they've spent the money uh, and some of those dollars were spent centrally and we had to say okay we spent them on behalf of of schools okay we uh, had to be able to i, I understand this I, I i i'm gonna let other other members start to ask questions i've had significant discussions with mr tantliff about this and this report really talks about you know it, money doesn't lie it goes where it goes right and it's just a reflection of of the spend per school and right. it's broken down by by student right so the driver behind all these discussions is to understand that our schools are being resourced fairly across the entire system right and and this discussion was also supposed to take us to what isn't reflected here, right? And and you just said that this includes central office spending and that every dollar, is, so that would make me think that you've now accounted for every dollar that went to a school throughout the year in this report. And I don't honestly believe that that's accurate. So um, I would love if that was accurate. I would well, love that. If you and, and we, I'd stay right on this sheet. But if on the other sheet that Mr. Barrow was talking about, it really does start off with all of our expenditures. Now, some of them they don't they exclude because they're 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 not necessarily like use of facilities. Um, uh, there's various things that they really don't go towards a child's education. But every dollar that ultimately is spent in some way towards a child's education, whether it be, you know, the air conditioning for the building, or I would believe like the salaries of central office, most central office folks end up in that, end up in those, those calculations. There are, so they, they, we, you start off with all expenditures, you do exclude some that ultimately don't uh, tie to a, a student's education, but anything else that that's for running the system, uh, to to educate the student is included on that on that that spreadsheet. OK, uh, Ms. Causey, um, go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. Um, so my question is um, the total expenditures. That's one number and then you divide it by the the students. Uh, the number of students and you come up with the per pupil funding. So where is the roll up of what's included in the total expenditure? And is that something that the budget committee can see? Sure, so again, the report, this this what we're looking at, this five pages is obviously just the report at the end of the day. Um, 
there is yeah. the underlying workbook that is putting together all of this, the, all of the report. Um, and kind of trying to capture a few questions at once. I mean, this does, um, there is a reconciliation here and don't, don't read too much into it, but yes, this does include all of the costs of operating grants and food service funds, which is, you know, which are the only funds that MSD is interested in for this, for these purposes. Um, again, as, as Chris said, there are some costs like community service, capital outlays, non-public placement, infants and toddlers, adult education, all of that's excluded from the report. So, um, so that kind of gives you a little understanding of what's going on. We then go through after bringing all the expenses in here. Um, again, certain expenses we know are specific. They're allocated, not allocated, but they are specific to a school. They have a reporting location. That reporting location is a school or an office or what have you. Um, so um, we do, this might be an interesting uh, worksheet to look at because what you'll see here is on, on the left side, you have um, you have costs that are allocated, and then you have the ones that are direct. Um, so it, again, this report could be when you get into the worksheets, you could look at this in, in a in a variety of different ways and come up to a. Can I make it bigger? Sure. I I think that's about all I could go. Um, or, or. OK. Um, so and, and if you follow this through, you'll see how this kind of comes to this report and these numbers will. I'm sorry here. We'll start to get to this gets combined and then it gets combined again. And this is the report. This is essentially the numbers you're going to see on that five page report. And this is where they're coming from. Um, they're all they all flow into this right here. So I, I'm sorry. Can you? Is, I don't know if I got the 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 question answered, but if you don't mind repeating. So uh, that is helpful. Thank you so much for um, that explanation and for showing that additional thing. Um, so, for instance, it, it doesn't quite cover everything. So, for instance, Rosedale Center is one of the highlighted at ninety three um, thousand and seventy eight dollars, and then um, and that's a that, that's a special program that we have. And then Meadowood Education Center, also a special program, similar in nature, 69,000. And Catonsville Center for Alternative Studies, um, another alternative school, 70,000. Um, I recall, as I've been on the board for several years, some very um, high dollar leasing costs related to Rosedale Center. So I'm curious with that 93,000, um, dollar price tag is part of that the lease um, which would not be a capital item um, but it is supplying the space and then the Catonsville for for differences has more space fewer students but also a much lower staff to student ratio um, and then a lower cost of 70,000 so I guess the question is when we look at these reports and we see anomalies what is the explanation for the anomaly and is that an area for improvement or is there a reasonable expectation as to why uh, this school they're all three alternative schools would have something different and if in fact it is the lease that is expensive then what can we do in the short range and the long range to mitigate that cost so that those resources could be put into a, um, another area to improve that the the children's academic outcome OK, so I, I'm, I would caution people the way they look at the report because the reason, at least in my eyes, and again, I think a lot of people could arrive at a few different opinions here, but when you have situations, again, like this, where you have a, um, a relatively low enrollment number in comparison, I should say, and relatively high staffing, um, you know, decently high square footage, um, I don't want to say so on and so on, but but yeah, because what happens is, for example, and this is this is kind of why I wanted to get to a few things from the beginning, but but it's OK. Um, you know, for example, like um, certain costs, you know, like. 
anything that falls into category 10, for example, operations and management, those costs are, are, are allocated based on the square footage of the, the building, school, what have you. So when you start allocating these costs, um, again, based on how MSD wants this presented, you, you start to run into these anomalies. Um, it, now, the square footage may not be a good example in this case, but if you have a situation where, for example, like staff, um, <clears throat> and I'm just trying to go through my notes, so mind me, but. Um, hey, Greg, let me just say while you're looking there to that. So, Ms. Yeah. Causey asked about the lease, so the specific lease would not come into play. It's just the total bucket is getting allocated based on square footage, and that's just one component of that activity. Right. Um, and, and so going along with what I say, so when we talk about staff, so the, the number of staff is used in order to allocate fixed charges. OK, so you could have, for example, uh, you know, a school. Um, I, I'd have to pick a good example here, but. Um, let me get a ruler. But, and, uh, and I would and I would uh, just to, to uh, echo with Mr. Barr say, most of our costs are people. We saw, I think someone said it earlier, 80% uh, of our, in the other conversation, 80% of our costs are people in fringe benefits. So most of these costs ultimately are people costs. And if you have, um, and then if you look at where you have smaller enrollment um, uh, programs, they're going to be, they're going to just tend to be more expensive. We, you know, there is a, there is a, um, you know, a, a an efficiency in larger schools. Certainly these smaller schools also are specialized programs, so they're going to have a higher staff to student ratio. So um, I also would echo what Mr. Barr said about using this as any kind of management tool. This is really trying, it's, a, it's, a, it's an early attempt of trying to um, be able to um, look at a very general cost per student and 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 maybe compare it to a, a similar school you really don't want to compare a, a special you know, some kind of a, a a special population school to a general ed school you you would want to compare two comparable elementary schools and that's what you would you you, you um that's what this data is for. I think long term, we are going to more and more have to identify cost at schools and get away from this allocate. What, what we're doing right now is, is we're taking some schools as I think Mr. Barr was going to the place where he showed the two spreadsheets of we have some costs that are, are that are tied directly to a school. That's great. A teacher that worked, you know, the, the the, the 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 cost at a specific school those are fair game now, when we start allocating costs out it's not it's not necessarily a science it's we're just saying we're going to spread these costs equally over schools it's not it's not necessarily wrong but it's not something where i would say this is exactly what was spent here this is kind of an approximation by allocating some central costs Long term, I think we're going to go to more and more actual costs being reported at the school level, which will make this, I think, in future years, probably a little bit more um, dependable. But um, I don't know if that helped at all. But it's it's you know it's you you have to be da it's dangerous on what you use this for. I think you know it has some uses in, in for comparison purposes, but to actually say why is this school spending so much? Um, you probably if you look at the enrollment and you look at the makeup of the students. You're uh, you're probably going to see the reason why one school is more expensive than another. Right, so so just, just well, thank you for that. And that's why I was sticking the comparison to the three alternative schools. So. All right, well, thank you, Ms. Causey. Ms. Hen, did you have a question? Um, I'll hold my question if other board members. Ms. Mack, do you have a question? I do, and it actually, um, I was pulling some data for two schools in my area that I know very, very well, Arbutus Elementary, which is location number 1302, 
and Halethorpe Elementary, which is 1313. Um, they have very similar student enrollment, very similar staff enrollment, pretty similar special education, um, English language learner, um, about a hundred uh, student difference between Title I. Um, they're both old schools. They're both relatively small schools. Um, and there's a $3,510 difference in per pupil spending between the two schools. And I'm, I'm just trying to understand why. So it's 1302 and 1313, which is one of the schools that was highlighted at 17,530. I think your title one point. Yeah, probably you have a you have about 100 more kids in Title I in Hal Thorpe Elementary. Um, and you have a higher level of staff at Hal Thorpe Elementary. Now, on top of those two situations, you have a lower enrollment at Arbutus. I mean, I'm sorry, you have a higher enrollment in Arbutus. So meaning you have less students, which would gen when you have less students, you're going to generate more costs. Um, that, it, that's just how it works. That, when we were talking a minute ago, I didn't really get to make my point, and, and that's okay, but, you know. Um, oh, no, please make it, because I'm trying to understand this. Sure, sure. I, 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 so, for example, just going back a little bit, Rosedale Center and Edmondson High, Edmondson Heights Elementary. Okay, a this is a good example because for staffing, they both have 57 and 56, respectively. Okay, so they have very similar staffing. What you're going to, so fixed charges for, for MSD purposes, fixed charges is spread over the number of staff that you have. Okay, so in a small school like Rosedale Center, where you only have, you have 57 staff, you're getting whatever that hit for fixed charges is, you're getting that same hit for 65 students that you would, that you did, the same hit that Edmondson is getting for 524 students. OK, does that make some sense? No, that does make sense, but those are two totally different schools. They're to different types of schools. Agreed. A and I guess my question is, you highlighted Halethorpe. If the superintendent says to you, why is Halethorpe $3,510 per pupil more than Arbutus? What, what is your answer going to be? Greg, could you bring back up that summary sheet so we can see it? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, that that would be great at that, to see because we are they both on the same page? They are. Yes, they are. They're ones at 13:02 and ones at 13:13. So again, my answer still stands. Um, again, you for Arbutus. It's, it's going to be less because one, you have less title one. So for example, so right off the bat, you're, you're going to have a, a, a less per student, per pupil dollar amount because you have less title one um, by 100. You also have, um, again, less staff at Arbutus. No. That's, oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, you do. But you have more students. You have more students, right. Again, the more students you have, the more that's going to divide your cost per student. Right. So, so that's and that's really the I think the key right is right there. It's OK. You have more Title One students, meaning uh, you, meaning you have more staff, but you have fewer students. So you have more staff, fewer students. That's going to add, that's going to lead to. Um, you know, both the numerator, you know, it's 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 that's why you're getting that you're getting you're getting both sides of the equation or are. are I'm not saying it properly, but yeah, it's. I, I it, understand. I yes, I yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm. Yeah, so that's what that's what it really is. Something that's that that. Um, you're right. You pull those out. You say oh, they're kind of the same, but Title One is a big driver, um, and there is a lot of. And you also notice that they are getting more. They're getting more federal funds too. So, um, um, but that's that's uh, you know there's a staff uh, there's staffing. Um, they also have slightly more special ed uh, students, um, and we don't know what the intensity of those special ed students are. Although it's a it's a it's an allocation, so it probably anyway the staffing and the number of enroll in the enrollment are, are what's driving that. Okay, I have two more very quick questions. One is, 
if we are trying to sh to as mr kuhn said you know show that we are or we as the board are looking to make sure that funds are allocated adequately to our schools it sounds to me like if we say we know that having more staff in a school is going to be better for outcomes if we load a school up with staff in an attempt to change outcomes it is going to appear that our per pupil spending is lower is that higher correct? it should be higher yep more staff less students i'm sorry okay yep yep uh, okay and then um hold on one second i had another Oh, Mr. Tantliff, we have talked about um, different sources of funding, and it's my understanding we talked about Title I grant dollars per student, special education add-on, magnet funding, special magnet funding, and then any other fun funds per student. Is any of that in here? Um, uh, everything is, oh, let's see, say the list again. I, it should, it's, this is from a few years ago, so the only thing that would be new, if Greg was doing the report today, at the end of this year, he's gonna have a bunch of ESSER funding. That didn't exist in this report yet. So, but Title I's in there, IDA pass-through grant, the per pupil funding, the magnet funding, those are all part of the general fund. So I think I got, you're saying everything from last month's report. Like grant was, dollars, magnet funding, yeah. special magnet funding, so, you know, if a school for whatever reason got a ton of grant money and other schools didn't, would that be reflected in here? It might not be reflected accurately because the grant dollars are not residing at the school. They're allocated from headquarters normally on almost all grants, even IDA, which is historically our second biggest grant for special ed. Those there's lots of positions paid for, but they're all charged to the grant, which is held centrally. OK, thank you very much for this. All of this information and all of your effort. I really appreciate it. Just, uh, wait, to clarify that, like the special ed costs are directly to the school because those salaries are captured at the school level, even if it's funded by a grant. Same with Title I. Title I positions have a reporting code that's tied to that school, so those salaries would be going directly to the school rather than allocated. Same thing with special ed teachers. Their, their reporting code is the school, so those grant expenditures would get shown directly to the school. What's allocated is the stuff that's not spent directly and, and shown directly at the school. So as Greg was talking about, like maintenance and operations costs, they're not tied directly to a school, so they're allocated based on square footage. So if one school's got a lot more square feet than another, it's gonna change the outcome of those numbers. Same thing with all of our fringe benefits. There's hundreds of millions of, you know, health care, pension costs, all that's allocated based on staffing. So if you got a lot more staff or a lot lower staff, it's going to change the outcome of that per pupil number. But all the grant costs are generally tied to the school. Thank you. Sorry, I was on mute. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there things that are are missing from this um, per pupil spend uh, that are outside of it that are not accounted for here? And I'm not sure if I mean I know you were just talking about grants and Title One is is all grant money. If I'm that's all included here, but are there things that we that are material that are not part of of this the total on this report here again not no i don't believe so i i've we have like i said there are certain categories that are excluded okay but when you look at this um the worksheet you'll see that the, the first step just to be clear the first step that i take in preparing this report is to get the expenditures and those expenditures are then they are reconciled to the CAFR. The, the 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 audited financial statements so that's one of my first steps is to ensure that we do have all costs related to or all expenditures related to this greg go through that list you said the list before go through the list and we can each each one of them we can tell you what you said uh it's it was like uh 
community use of facilities. Um, you, you went through the list of adult education, the things that are excluded. You had, you had read it off, I believe you had read it off, or I don't know if you read it or just went off the top of your head. I believe this is, I'm not sure if this is what you mean, but in the exclusion yeah. section, so community service, um, right. capital outlays. Right, right. Non-public placements, which is a big number, is not included in this. And the in the logic and that there, would not be tied to a school, correct? Because that's that's the that's the, the reason, right? Those students are not tied to that school, right? right. They're all in private, right? So these this these are expenses that they say, okay, these really don't count towards a child's education, the child the children at that school's education. So we're going to take them out, but every other dollar is included. Now, is it allocated? proper you know properly to the right school because we're using this kind of standard formula that's kind of the the rub you know because we're we're just saying okay we're going to allocate this this cost out by square footage we're going to allocate this cost out by you know the number of special ed students so we're allocating costs after they've been incurred right so can i ask a um, um a question um and I really appreciate this and I, I wish we had more time. <laughs> I know we all wish we had more time. Um, so there's a plan for a new elementary school in the Northwest and it is supposed to be a net zero school. So in my mind, when I hear net zero, that means that there's gonna be zero dollars spent in total, like it'll net out to be zero for electricity or for energy, right? But it's still going to have a footprint and it's going to have square f square feet here, right? Um, so energy cost that's basically spread across the entire system would not necessarily, it should be excluded from that school, right? right? But it's, but based on these formulas, it won't be. Is that, is that true? That's exactly it because MSG says you allocate maintenance costs and operation costs, which includes electricity, utilities, grounds, you know, all those types of services. That's done on square footage. It doesn't give you the option to say, well, that school is net zero, so we're not going to allocate it there. That's just MSD's formula. But 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 long term, long term meaning, I think the the direction is to get to a point where we use actual utility bills to that school. So this will that problem should be fixed eventually, but not not in the numbers right now. And I don't know when that's going to happen. That's a you know uh, because that depends on a lot of everyone in the state has to be able to do that. Allocate uh, allocate expenses at the school level in order to compare things. Right now, the reason we have this formula for the way to do things is they want to make sure that Baltimore County Public Schools is doing things the same way as you know yeah, fair public. enough. I, I just wanted yeah. to be clear yes. that yes. that there might be um, minor because that's out of all that's, the schools we're talking about our first net zero school. So that's know. the key to that's the key to the discussion right there, though, that you you, you have an allocation method that's not uh, not necessarily accurate all the time. Okay. And just to play devil's advocate, maybe it's not my turn to speak, but <laughs> that's just a what we're saying, though, is you, you, we, we need to think about the fairness, though, just because one student goes to a school that's state of the art and has a, a zero net. Um, you know, it, so that it would almost seem that that school has less that they're spending on those students. If, if you exclude all those electricity costs and you're so you're kind of you're kind of not taking an even approach on everybody you know so so kids in a if we if we if everything was specific to a school then for example let's say you were just in a school that has i don't know terrible heating and you know efficiencies of, of the building so it looks like oh we spend so much money on those on that school but it's just because the school isn't efficient you know the way it was built at the age of it et cetera et cetera just just sticking on the, the the utility costs so so that is why msd takes the approach to spread the cost based on square footage to kind of give everyone an even uh you know playing field if you will for taking some piece of that cost 
Yeah, that's a that's a real good point because it's a it's a similar and I don't, I don't want to take it way off off topic here, but you could have two staff members, one at school A and one at school B. And if you really identify costs when you get down to identifying, say, fringe benefit costs and one teacher has the full family coverage for fringe benefit for health benefits and one teacher has just single coverage, it would make the cost at the one school lower than the cost at this, you know, at the, uh, the than the cost at the other school. But the student in the classroom is not getting any different education because one one teacher has family coverage and another teacher has single coverage. It's not it really is not impacting their education. So it is it is it's very difficult, uh, you know, topic to really make it. Right. To this. I, I understand the allocations are there for a reason and that makes sense. Um, so, you know, we are at time and I want to be cognizant of of of, of people's time and what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly go around uh, on this topic. Um, are there any further questions? Um, you know, at this point in time for this topic. Mr. Kuhn. Yes, Ms. Yeah, I just have a quick one and and that has to do with the timing and, and thank you. This has been fantastic. Um, I, I would love to get this information as often as possible. So that that's what's driving my question. And you had mentioned that um, the next year's report won't be available or was just submitted the end of April, I believe it was, and it was waiting approval. Um, can you give us any more detail about what are, whose approval we're, we're waiting on and when might the board expect that so, that would so be available? The, the fiscal year 21 report was, was um, sent in December of 21. So it, it usually takes MSD a little bit of time to go through all the various LEAs and provide comments. And we did receive our comments and provided responses to MSD. So we're really just waiting on an update from MSD to say we're good to go, uh, uh, you know, or not. If they want us to make a change, then we make a said change based on whatever they're telling us. But um, so, I, I mean, I, I can't exactly put a date on it, but I'm hoping that it's within a month from today, say that we could have some the new the, the fiscal year 21 numbers finalized. Great. And and we can receive um, this report that you provided went for the fiscal year 21 with the fiscal year 21 numbers. Is that something you produce normally or was this produced specifically um, for this committee's request? I, I, I mean, everything that for this committee was was is something we already have um again the, the, the i'm sorry oh we no can, that's great we can put it on the agenda miss hen in a future month once it's available we could go through it again if that's what the committee would like through the 21. i, I just think it would be terrific for the board to receive this as it's available that's all sure. yearly thank you very much that's all i had You're thanks welcome. thank you okay i see miss causey has a question um, thank you, Mr. Kuhn, and I just wanted to um, thank uh, Mr. Hartlove and Mr. Barra and Mr. Tantliff for uh, all of this information. It is very helpful as we as board members try to analyze that we are equitably and effectively applying resources to all of our students. The um, I had a short question about the state rate capacity, perhaps considering adding that as a piece of information, but my real question was uh, there was a statement made earlier about using the template from MSDE. So was the template the five page spreadsheet that we received or um, the, what, the what was the exact is, reference to the template? The template is the Excel. Right. Every, everything you've seen has been has been MSDE. Uh, you know, this is all it has to meet their their approval. When we send it in, they're just checking to make sure that you know that, that one county that we followed the methodology we followed, yeah. and it we're, everyone every so you can theoretically compare one jurisdiction's schools to another okay and then do they provide comments back based on the report based on their review of all of the districts it's not comments necessarily i mean the, the the things are they're either saying we believe you allocated properly or we we have a question we we want to make sure you did this properly uh we want to you know so it's just making sure that we followed the the um you know 
the procedures, the that we did it the way they told us to do it. Yeah, and I can clarify one thing to clarify. This spreadsheet is MSD's spreadsheet. We cannot modify it because they use this to upload into their system. And they may check things like enrollment. They might check the enrollment numbers and say, well, our enrollment numbers, this enrollment number doesn't look right. So that would be the type of question you might get back. And then we would double check it and get back to them. Great. Thank you, that's very helpful. Are there any further questions before we move on? All right, thank you very much. At yes, this thank point, you very, very much. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is a great item. Really appreciate it. Um, the next item is um, information and basically the review that the corrective action plan for the OIGE uh, has been attached. We're not going to discuss it tonight. It's there for information. We have an action item. Uh, to create uh, um, a standard operating procedure for managing the budget um, associated with law, um, the law, the, law, the legal services that the board procures. So I, I just mentioned that because it's just a point of information. There's no discussion or questions regarding that at this meeting, and um, I will I will open it quickly to. Um, board members, if you, do you have any questions before I go over the announcements and adjournment? Any questions or items of discussion? Okay. The last item on the agenda is announcements. The next budget committee meeting is scheduled for April 20th at 5.30 p.m. There, is there any further business? All right, hearing none, the meeting is now adjourned. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank, I want to thank everyone for their time tonight. Uh, this was very insightful. I appreciate it. Thank you very much.